Quick editor's note, the video you're about to watch is based on info from these three videos. One, where I slow down electricity and show that it's linked to the speed of light. A second one, where I show that electricity prefers to flow through connected wires and not disconnected wires to solve a maze. And a third one, where I try to provide an intuition for voltage, current, and resistance using a lot of different analogies, most notably a narrow trough of water. You don't need to have watched these videos to see this one, but if you want to learn more, they exist. Here I have a very uninteresting circuit, but it's going to get a lot more interesting when recorded at ridiculously high speed. Over here we have a battery. This is just a regular 9 volt battery, although this one's mostly dead. And although it's not plugged in yet, this is our power supply. Over here on the left we see that the wire splits in two. The electricity from the battery could take this branch where it would meet disconnected wires, or it could take this branch where I've soldered the wires together. Some entry level electrical engineering tells us that of course the electric current is going to flow through the connected wires and not flow through the disconnected wires. That means we're actually going to have a loop of electrons moving. They're going to be heading away from the battery in the black wire, rounding the corner at this solder joint and then heading towards the battery everywhere in the red wire. Over here, where the wires are disconnected, there are still electrons in the wire, but none of them should be moving because they can't go anywhere. The question I want to ask is, how do they know? Like, if I plug in this battery over here, all of a sudden, electrons are going to start, you know, chugging their way through this wire. But we know from Ohm's law that the battery voltage and the resistance of the wire should cause a very specific number of electrons to be flowing through this loop every second. The instant I connect this battery, the other end of the circuit is a meter away. Information traveling at the speed of light takes more than three nanoseconds to traverse this setup, which means that when I plug in this battery and the battery sort of asks the universe, you know, how many electrons should I pump into the black wire every second? It takes more than six nanoseconds for it to get a reply. So what do you think is gonna happen? Based on comments that I've gotten on other videos, here are four possible answers. Option A, the electric field has already solved the circuit. As soon as the battery is connected, the correct amount of current will flow through the connected branch and no current will flow down the disconnected branch. Option B, the electric field has already solved the circuit, but it still has to update information at the speed of light. So as soon as you connect the battery, the correct current starts to flow in the wires in a sort of bubble that expands from the connection point. Option C, the battery pumps an arbitrary amount of current into the wire, and despite one branch being disconnected, the current that's flowing splits when it gets to the fork and goes down both wires. Although this is initially wrong, it eventually stabilizes. Option D, Initially, nothing happens. The battery updates the electric field at the speed of light, and once information has returned from the other end of the circuit, the correct amount of current starts to flow in the connected leg all at once. In this video, we're actually going to be able to record a circuit like this fast enough to differentiate between these four options. So think about it for a minute, make your guess, and drop it in the comments while the title card plays. Are you thinking about it? I'm going to come back to this in more detail at the end of the video, but I wanted to give you something else to think about now. This is the branching circuit replicated using my favorite, the water channel model for electricity. Do you think that electrons in the wire will do the same thing as the water in this mock-up, despite the fact that flipping a switch is a much more dynamic system than the water model was meant to handle? You're allowed to update your guess once more before I show the real circuit in motion. Unfortunately, observing electrons moving through wires is obscenely difficult, and I think that this is one of the reasons that electricity is so hard to learn about. I didn't properly understand the concept of line impedance, for example, until I had built the apparatus that I planned to use for this video and used it to watch waves of electricity traveling around in wires. A regular camera, like the one on your phone, can't see electron motion. And even if it could, the changes occur on the order of the speed of light. For reference, this is a recent video from the slow-mo guys, taken at 82,000 frames per second. That sounds really fast. But in between each frame of this video, light can travel more than two miles, 3.5 kilometers. Since electricity, as in the signals and energy delivered by electric current, travels anywhere between the speed of light and maybe half the speed of light, 
we clearly can't use a regular high-speed camera to observe changes in a tabletop circuit model that's only a few meters long. In fact, we're going to need to cheat even more with slower electricity and longer wires. I'm sorry for the really weird camera angle for these shots, but this literally takes up the entire room and I can only set it up on the floor unless I set it up outside. So this is what we've got. I did try a whole bunch of methods to create extra slow transmission lines, but I ended up with this homemade twisted pair in which electricity travels at about 60% the speed of light. But since that's still too fast, I made a lot of this twisted pair and I ended up zigzagging it onto these wooden frames, each of which holds about 23 meters of cable. I'll get to some of that decision making later, like why I have this twisted pair and why my scope probes look like this. But for now, we have a larger and slower version of the circuit from the intro. At the top here, at the start of the circuit, we literally just have a 9 volt battery. And that 9 volt battery gets plugged into this circuit, which is an electronic switch, which is basically just able to plug the battery in faster than I would be able to. After that, it goes into this cable, this twisted pair, which goes zigzagging, zigzagging, zigzagging for 23 meters into this Y, where we have three cables connected. And then it goes zigzagging, zigzagging over here to an open circuit where the two wires are disconnected. And it goes zigzagging, zigzagging, zigzagging to here where the wires are connected. Which means that after this battery is plugged in, we should have electric current flowing through these wires and electric current flowing through these wires where they're shorted together. But we should not have any electricity flowing over here where the wires are disconnected. These are basically just attached, but they don't really do anything. Now the round trip time at the speed of electricity is about 500 nanoseconds. When I plug in this battery, or when this circuit plugs in this battery really, really quickly, it takes about 500 nanoseconds for that information to make it all the way to both ends of the cable and come back. That's slow enough that we should actually be able to measure it. The most common tool for analyzing very fast changes in electronic circuits is called an oscilloscope. I have one right here, we're going to use it in a minute, but in general I find oscilloscopes and analysis of circuits with oscilloscopes to be very, very limiting. An oscilloscope is basically a voltmeter combined with a really accurate clock, and it will draw you a plot of how the voltage on a wire changes over time. For example, what if I wanted to know exactly how fast this switch is? When you plug in the battery, how quickly does the voltage on the wire go from zero to maximum? So on this plot, the x-axis is time and the y-axis is voltage. So when we plug in the battery, we can see that the voltage goes from zero to high in a very, very short span of time. This whole event takes less than 10 nanoseconds. This is a really fast switch. In this particular case, it gets a little weirder because when we zoom out, we can see there's a little bit of a step right here and then there's another step right here. And I mean, this is just sort of bizarre. Like there's a dip right there before it stabilizes. Like what's actually going on? If you want to play this back as an animation, we can imagine flipping this switch at an absurdly fast rate the voltage at this point in the circuit spikes up and then mystery stuff happens in the rest of the circuit and then the voltage over here steps down a little bit and then more mystery stuff happens in the rest of the circuit and then the voltage steps down and ends up stabilizing. This is why I find oscilloscope traces so limiting. You can see what's happening at one location, but you can't really see everything. The trick that we can use is to probe more points on the circuit at once. If I take an extra set of scope probes and I attach them in the middle, now we see something very interesting. The voltage at this point in the circuit doesn't rise until 116 nanoseconds later. If I measure the voltage at this point, at the end where the wires are connected together, we basically see, oh man, it's very noisy. Hot, hot. Let's melt my fingers together, that'll help. If I measure the voltage at the end of the circuit that's shorted out, where the wires are just soldered together, we can see on the scope that the voltage basically stays flat the whole time. But now requiring me to be completely under the table, if we measure the voltage over here, if we wait about 240 nanoseconds, then we see the voltage at this point all the way at the end of the wire start to go up. So let's run that same visualization again. When we flip this switch, we see the voltage at the switch go up and then something happens, probably in the first panel, and then we see the voltage go up in the middle, and then something happens probably in both panels, and then we see something happen in the panel with the disconnected wires, which was the panel where we didn't expect to see anything happening. 
Then we just start to see voltages changing all over the circuit. It's not super clear what's going on. This is why I get frustrated with oscilloscopes as a learning tool sometimes, because you can't see the propagation. So with a couple extremely tedious hours of stripping wires with an X-Acto knife, I added taps every four feet so that I could attach probes all over the place and play them back at the same time. This ends us with something that looks like this. If I show it in a more graphy view here, maybe some of these features get clearer. I really love this footage, and it shows that no, the battery has no idea how much current should flow when you plug it in. The battery is connected, a whole bunch of current flows down the wire. When it hits the Y, the current gets split, but also something looks like it reflects back towards the battery. That's kind of weird. And now we have a pulse, actually two identical pulses, traveling down both far wires. Remember, this wire has the ends disconnected and this wire has the ends soldered together. When the two identical pulses reach the end of their respective wires, the one that meets a disconnected circuit slams into a wall. All of that current sloshes back and piles up. The other pulse gets shorted out, drops to zero, and also sends that information back towards the battery. If I speed up here, we see over a few reflections, the battery realizes it tried to send way too much power the first time, and slowly the whole circuit settles down. Current, the actual flow of electrons, ends up following this slope, as the high voltage at the battery drops to nothing at the short, and in the disconnected wire, where nothing should be happening, there isn't a slope, no voltage to make electrons move. Until the waves actually get to the ends of the wire, they look identical. Because these waves of current don't know what is at the end of their respective branches of the circuit. Once they realize what's at the end of their circuit, they transmit that information back to the battery. This branch says, whoa, I need a bit less current this way, it looks like a wall. And this one says, hey, I need more current, make this hill a little bit steeper. When both these signals meet each other and eventually get back to the battery, there's a negotiation and it requires a lot of back and forth communication. In this case, the whole circuit took about 4,000 nanoseconds to stabilize. That's like eight round trips. I also want to point out that these wires can't talk to each other through this gap. I just wanted to make it easy to compare the waves by putting them side by side. So for those of you keeping score at home, the answer is C. It takes much longer than one round trip for electricity for the current to stabilize and for the circuit to obey Ohm's law in DC. But that leaves us with a few more questions, like what are these waves that are traveling through this circuit? And how does the battery and switch assembly here decide how much current should initially flow in the wire if it's just guessing and it doesn't know how much current should flow to either end? To answer those questions, I have a similar but simpler circuit set up here. Instead of a big branching circuit with lots and lots of wire, this is just a straight shot. So I have the same very fast electronic switch that plugs the battery into the wire, and then I have 23 meters of my custom twisted pair, and at the end, two wires that are dangling free so that I can attach whatever resistor I want as a load on the end of this circuit. That basically means that we have a power supply and we have a load that are separated by hundreds of nanoseconds of delay time. It's really easy to go in here and say, I know the resistance of the wire, I know the resistance of the load, I know the resistance that's built into the power supply, and you can calculate how much current, literally how many electrons per second are going to be chugging their way through this wire. But, as we just saw, the correct number of electrons don't flow the first time you hit the switch. They sort of have to bounce around and figure it out. For the first test, I'm just going to short out the end. I've soldered these two wires together. So this big long chain is terminated in a zero ohm resistor. I spent what ended up being quite a while writing a script that brings in these voltage traces and produces an exaggerated view of how the electrons actually move in the wire. So I wanna be very clear, this top plot is real data that I actually collected. This is 20 individual oscilloscope traces that are all being played back at the same time. And this, is a heavily exaggerated animation of the electron's motion based on that data. And then this final plot is a realistic, albeit extremely noisy graph of electron drift velocity along the wire's length that we'll talk about in a minute, but it's also based on the raw data. 
For now, let's cover most of this up. The fundamental point here is the speed of electricity and the speed of the electrons, and those are not the same thing. If we look at this wave traveling down the wire, we see that it travels this 23 meters in about 120 nanoseconds, which means it's traveling at almost 200,000 kilometers per second, which is like two thirds the speed of light. That is absurdly fast. However, if we look at these electrons that have started moving, they go a whole lot slower. In the graphic, the individual electrons are moving about 10 times slower than the wave. And that right there is the exaggeration because in reality, the electrons in this wire are traveling about 10 trillion times slower than the wave. But that doesn't make for a very understandable graphic. But if they were drawn out accurately, you'd never be able to see that they were scrunched in some places and more spread out in other places because the spacing just doesn't change very much. That said, it is the scrunching and spreading out of electrons in different parts of wires that causes electrons to do what they do and flow through wires. If we look at the wires, these are the two wires of the twisted pair, although the twist really doesn't matter. When we flip the switch and this wave travels down the wire, we see that the electrons are pulled from one wire and shoved into the other. But at the end, the electrons haven't started moving yet. Any given point on this trace at the top is the voltage or potential difference between the wires of the twisted pair below. When this voltage goes up here, but is still zero over here, we're saying that in this region, there are more electrons in the wire than this wire. But at the far end, there are just as many electrons in both wires. Of course, this is about to change. As this wave reaches the end of the wire, all these electrons start moving. So in answer to our first question, what are these waves? These waves are waves of motion and waves of electron bunching and scrunching. At one instant, if there are electrons moving to the right in this part of the wire and not moving in this other part of the wire, the only way that can be happening is if the electrons in between those two regions in this part of the wire are actually getting closer together. And if we play this footage forwards, that's exactly what we see. It's a common argument in my comment section that these waves of electricity are just the electric field and that the electrons don't really move. But if that were the case, this zigzag layout wouldn't work. The electric field would cover the whole panel faster than I'd be able to measure it. These phenomena only make sense if electrons are actually scooching down the wire and bunching up, even if ever so slightly. That's why electricity follows wires and cables. It can only go where the electrons can scooch forwards. I originally had this circuit set up where the wires at the end were shorted together. So it was basically like a zero ohm resistor. But now, I've cut them apart. So there's an infinity ohm resistor right here where the two wires are just, you know, hanging free. So what do you think is going to happen in this case? There's no way for electrons to flow down the black wire all the way down to the end, somehow magically jump this gap and flow back along the red wire. But we know that when we flip this switch, we're going to have current. Electrons are going to start moving in this part of the wire the moment we flick this switch. So what's that gonna look like when it gets to the end? It's going to look like this. After we flip the switch, we get the exact same step, the same wave of electricity at about two and a quarter volts of potential and about 15 milliamps of current are flowing in that part of the wire. But when that wave gets to the end, it can't go anywhere. Basically, these electrons slam into the end of the wire and pile up. Now, we have a big steep slope of voltage in the other direction. If the first slope accelerated electrons towards the load, this reverse slope decelerates the electrons, and awesomely, the magnitudes match. So all the electrons start moving, then the reflected wave perfectly cancels them out, and they all stop moving. Of course, it does bounce back and forth a bit more, but after all that, we end up with two wires full of unmoving electrons. The fact that at the end of this animation, this extremely data-driven animation, all of the electrons stop moving, like makes me so happy. The fact that the wave going one way is perfectly canceled by the wave going the other way when it hits the end of this is so cool. And that can be measured accurately enough to make an animation like this with an oscilloscope that's only a few hundred bucks. It just, I was so excited when I saw this animation for the first time. But both wires are at different potentials. There's a voltage difference between them. If you wanna get technical, we're now seeing the wire's capacitance measured in charge per volt. Physically, how many charged electrons we need to add to a wire to change its voltage. This also, in a roundabout way, answers our second question. 
In both cases, the exact same wave left from the battery because the circuit at this end didn't yet know what was at this end. And the magnitude of this wave was largely controlled by the capacitance of the wire. How many electrons can be crammed into this wire when you apply a certain voltage? Or to be linguistic about it, the wire's capacity to hold extra electrons. This value is very high for instances like this, where you have nearby wires wrapped in insulation, and extremely low for wires that are far apart with nothing in between. So now let's go back to the Y-shaped circuit, and hopefully you'll see all these effects present in a much more complicated model. So now we understand this first bit. When we send a pulse of voltage down the wire, at the ends of the branches, the electrons aren't moving yet. But everywhere this wave has been, electrons have started moving. And at the edge of the wave, the electrons are either clumping up or spreading out. Now, when this pulse hits the fork, three things happen. Part of the wave reflects back, part of the wave continues into the connected branch, and part of the wave continues into the disconnected branch. These waves continue until they hit their respective loads, a dead short or zero ohm resistor and an open circuit or infinity ohm resistor. Just like in the single cable test, we see the electrons that hit the open circuit pile up and reflect back, stopping all motion. And in the other branch, the wave reflects back low, actually accelerating the electrons in the wire further. This branching circuit is a dramatically more complicated system than the single cable terminated in a resistor, but hopefully you can see the same patterns in both. We can continue tracing individual reflections and waves and interactions between electrons in all of these wires and carefully predicting what will happen next, or we can just fast forward to the end and see that all of this hardly matters because after a few hundred nanoseconds, everything settles out and we get exactly what we expect. A descending gradient from power supply to load where the DC version of Ohm's law is satisfied for all locations. This is the same net result I measured in the electricity maze video, but at that scale, I wasn't able to record it fast enough to show you how it got that way. Hopefully now, it makes a little more sense, and you can imagine these waves sort of percolating through every possible way to solve that maze at once before the circuit settled into that result. At the start, I mentioned the water channel model was going to make a comeback, and I want to show you what parts of the water channel model are applicable and where you have to be careful. And then somewhere we got one down there. Is it only three leaks? It's pretty great. I recreated the circuit as best I could with acrylic sheet water channels and used large basins of water as a supply and a load. So effectively, we have two capacitors connected to ground, a switch, and an extra bit of wire. So check out these shots side by side. In both cases, the wave leaves from the supply, travels down the first leg, splits at the branch, sloshes up at the dead end, and sloshes down at the open end. The fact that this water channel model is able to so accurately depict the dynamics of electricity, a completely different system, and one that operates on timescales that are orders of magnitude faster than water, is just really amazing to me. But it's not perfect. Weirdly, in the water version, the back reflections aren't as pronounced. When the signals hit the loads at the end, we absolutely see one wave pile up and the other drop low. But in general, the dynamics of water are a little more direct, and the signals returning to the power supply aren't as obvious. One reason for this may be that the parameters of the circuits don't match. If I repeat the electricity experiment with higher resistance wire, not impedance, but resistance, we get a slightly closer analog, where the reflections of electricity are significantly diminished. But while water in a narrow channel and electrons in a wire do show a lot of similarities, like seriously, I could keep listing them for 40 minutes, inertia is something that's really finicky. If you look at this model from above, you can see that it's not symmetrical, and neither is it straight. The way that water maintains inertia around corners is extremely different from electrons, which pick up an effective inertia while drifting by creating a magnetic field around the wire. This divot, for example, would never appear in electron flow in a wire. And at the end, I wasn't able to create a perfect low voltage supply to pull the signal down, but this is something that's really easy in wires. I always imagine circuits, even dynamic ones with waves, like water flowing through these channels. But sometimes the mental image with the idealized water flowing down an idealized water trough is a better analog to electricity than building one in real life and filming it in real life. However, even this real one with all of its imperfections is an excellent qualitative model that I think provides a lot of intuition 
for an otherwise very difficult topic. Of course, what actually happens in my head is that when this doesn't match, I start thinking of a more complicated electronic circuit that would match this better. Like this milk jug at the end is basically a capacitor and the fact that I've cut it off makes it a voltage regulator and it's a lot better than basically what I had before was like a voltage sensitive resistor where I just ended it. Anyway, I hope that you learned something about electricity watching this video. I certainly learned a lot about electricity making this video and had a lot of fun trying to figure out how to film electricity at a ridiculous speed and making the equivalent water model to think about. I feel like I'm completely incapable of writing a short script anymore. There was an awful lot that got cut from this video, especially a more mathematical view of this circuit and how you can actually calculate the strengths of these waves, and a lot more with the single cable that was terminated with various resistors. So that all ended up becoming another video. You should head over to Alpha Phoenix 2, where I have the Q&A from my previous mainline video posted, along with another few short videos that I think you'll enjoy. Thanks for watching. See you next time.